Man, it's so great to have Eddie Van Halen with us all weekend. Uh, David Mock, otherwise known as, and Kyle and the whole worship team, thank you all for that. Your very best impersonation of Fleetwood Mac. And maybe you're wondering, why in the world are we listening to Fleetwood Mac during the offering song at church? Well, there's a reason for that. It's really the sermon illustration. Uh, we're in a message series called Jesus Did Not Say That. And the phrase that Jesus did not say that we're going to be kind of digging into today as we continue this message series is this phrase, I'm good with whatever you want to do. Jesus never said, I'm good with whatever you want to do. He, he may have said you can go your own way, but if he did, it would have been in the context of, yes, you have freedom, you have free will. You can choose however you want to live. You can choose the way you want to go. It may not be a good way. It may not be a wise way or a healthy way, but you have freedom to choose which way you want to go with your life. Now, I think maybe this is what the writer of Proverbs is getting at in Proverbs 14, verse 12. We'll put it up on the screen. Let's all read this out loud together. There's a way of life that looks harmless enough. Look again. It leads straight to hell. Aren't you glad you came to worship this morning? Um, I'm, I'm always reminded of this verse when my beloved Iowa Hawkeyes are playing a football game and my son Kemble says to me, Dad, can we have cheese dip when we watch the game? I'm a sucker for Velveeta and Rotel. And so pretty much any time Kemble says, can we have cheese dip? I'm like, yes, absolutely. I think Jesus wants us to have uh, Velveeta and Rotel. In fact, what are the other things that Jesus might want us to have? Chicken wings and pizza and that sort of thing. I mean, there's only eight games this year. How bad can it be to eat tailgate food like this eight times over the course of the fall. And so we got all of our food ready and we watched the Hawkeyes just cream Minnesota. We also got to watch the Ankeny Hawks take out the evil empire, those Catholics from West Des Moines. Uh, it, just to be clear, we don't think Catholics are evil. We're on the same team, right? At least when it comes to faith, just not on the football field. So uh, we're watching the games and we're eating and it was great until bedtime. And then I've got like heartburn and I've got an upset stomach and I can't get comfortable and I can't fall asleep. And I realized I went my own way and it led me straight to this hell that I'm now experiencing. We can go our own way. But the good news is Jesus invites us to go his way and Jesus way is a way better way. Now, before we start digging into what is Jesus' way, let's talk a little bit about kind of the cultural reality that we find ourselves in these days. And when I say these days, I don't mean like it just started a week ago. This has been going on for a couple of generations now, this idea of moral relativism. Uh, I, I first kind of started thinking about this way back my senior year of college. I, I stacked all of my classes my senior year so that they would be as easy as, as possible. So I was in a 100 level uh, sociology class my senior year. Pretty much everyone else was a freshman. And at one point in that uh, semester, the professor asked the class, what do you think? Is there such a thing as absolute truth? Is truth relative or is truth absolute? And, and I watched kind of in amazement as freshman after freshman after freshman said, uh, no such thing as absolute truth. And I was thinking, what is wrong with young people these days? I mean, these 18-year-olds clearly need the wisdom of their 22-year-old elder statesman on, on this one, right? I, I was wondering, what would we do if we were in a class taught by Roger Wingert? Roger Wingert, a professor emeritus in philosophy at uh, the University of Illinois. And for years, when he would uh, teach his philosophy class, he would start off at the beginning of each semester just kind of walking through the syllabus. Here's what we're going to be studying. Uh, here, here are the test dates. Here are the papers that I'm going to ask you to write. And then at the end of that introduction, he would say, and here's the way we're going to be grading you in this class. I grade people according to your height. And there was always a smart alecky uh, tall person who was like, yay, great, I think that's an awesome idea. And the professor would say, the short people are going to get A's, and the taller you are, your grade's going to go down from there. And the, the class would just, is this guy serious? What are we supposed to Eventually somebody would say, uh, that doesn't seem like a very fair grading system. And Professor Wenger would say, fair? Who, who said anything about fair? It's my class. I can choose however I want to grade. And the students would start pushing back a little, and, and somebody would say, well, I guess you can choose however you want, but what you should do is grade us on how well we learn the material. 
Uh, greatest by how well we do on our tests or uh, the papers, are we able to write articulately about whatever it is we're uh, supposed to be learning and, and thinking about? That is the way you should grade us. And Professor Wenger would say, I don't understand these words, should and ought. When, when you start using language like this, it, you betray the very relativism that you say you, you believe in. It's my class. And there's no external standard that says, here's what I need to conform to in, in terms of how I grade you, so I'm just going to choose whatever I want. And that will be the way that you get graded, and if you don't like it, so what? Say la vie. I, I think there's a part of us that wants to say, yeah, I, I, I think it depends. Is truth absolute? Is truth relative? And we want to say, it depends. But when we push into that question far enough, we all end up at a place where we say, no, there actually, there is a standard. There's right and there's wrong. There's good and there's not good. The question is, who sets the standard? Who gets to decide what the standard is? And that gets us to Jesus. Uh, Matthew chapter 5, our Bible reading for today, comes from the Sermon on the Mount, which takes place pretty early on in Jesus' ministry. But he's been in ministry long enough at this point that uh, he's a recognized rabbi. And, and a rabbi in Jesus' day, they were the ones in charge of sort of studying, uh, learning the Old Testament scriptures, and then teaching it to the people so that the people would know what's the best way for us to live. Nobody in Jesus' day, nobody in Israel in Jesus' day believed you could go your own way. Everybody believed the way for us to go is the way of Torah. We have to follow Torah, which is the Hebrew word for law. And so they needed rabbis to interpret the scripture and say, here's what it means to be obedient to uh, the commandments of God. So part of what Jesus is doing early on in the Sermon on the Mount, he's kind of giving his interpretation of what does it look like for us to follow Torah. Don't misunderstand why I have come. I did not come to abolish the law of Moses or the writings of the prophets. Why does Jesus have to say this? It's because people are misunderstanding why he came. People are looking at how Jesus lives and what Jesus teaches, what he does, and they're coming to the conclusion Jesus wants to get rid of the law of Moses. Because Jesus' way is the way of grace. He, he breaks a lot of laws as it's connected to what does it mean to keep the Sabbath. Jesus is hanging out with sinners. He becomes known as a, a friend of sinners. And the people who follow the law as closely as possible think, well, Jesus doesn't even care about the law. He wants to love people. He wants to forgive people. His way of grace basically just means you can do whatever you want to do because you're going to get grace at the end anyway. And Jesus says, no, I never said that. Don't misunderstand why I have come. I did not come to abolish the law of Moses or the writings of the prophets. No, I came to accomplish their purpose. I came to accomplish their purpose. What's the purpose? of the law? What's the purpose of the writings of the prophets? Martin Luther, uh, the great uh, leader of the Reformation, he's digging into this question, and Luther comes up with three uses of the law. First use of the law, Luther calls them a curb. I'm going to call it a bumper. You ever go bowling with kids? I love bowling with kids. I always have my best score when I'm bowling with kids because you push the button and up come the bumpers uh, to make sure that you cannot throw a gutter ball. The bumpers make it possible for the ball to go the way the ball is supposed to go, towards the pins and, and to knock it down. The bumpers make it for a much more enjoyable game of, uh, of bowling. Do you call it a game of bowling? Sure, it's a game of bowling. Anyway, um, at Hope, sometimes we talk about it this way. We want to avoid ditches. We don't want you to fall into the gutter. There's a ditch on this extreme or a ditch on that extreme, and we want to go the, the middle path, the path that leads to life. And this is true for us as individuals, that we need bumpers, but it's also true for us in terms of what does it mean to function as a healthy society. When God gives Moses the commandments on top of Mount Sinai, People of Israel are on their way from slavery to the promised land, and the commandments are basically God's 
a manual, God's instruction book for here's how you live together as a healthy society. Here's how you live together as God's people. And there are boundaries. There are things that I want you to be doing, and there are things that I want you to avoid doing. Don't go outside the boundaries. Don't fall into the gutter. Stay inside the bumpers. We need this as individuals, and we need this as a community, as a society. First use of the law is bumpers. A second use of the law, Luther refers to the law as a mirror. I saw on the news this week uh, that uh, Christie's, the auction house, they were auctioning off uh, 2,400 photographs from kind of the, the golden age of space exploration in America. Photographs like this one from the late 60s. This is Buzz Aldrin kind of doing a space selfie. Standing on the moon, you've got uh, the earth behind him, a selfie 50 years ago. Are you good at taking selfies? There's kind of an art to taking selfies. Have you noticed this? Like, you can be really bad at it. And, and I've noticed this, too, when you're on Zoom meetings, how interesting it is. Have you ever pay attention to what you look like in a, in a Zoom meeting? For me, the camera angle means everything. If the camera is too low, I don't even recognize myself. Who is that guy? Like, I see things when the camera is too low that I don't, I don't want to see about myself, if I'm going to be honest. But the camera doesn't lie. Mirror doesn't lie. And so for Luther, when he says one of the functions of the law, one of the things the law is good for, it acts as a mirror to help us see some things about ourselves that we don't particularly want to see. Moral failings, disobedience, uh, ways in which we fall short of God's standard, of, of following the way that God would call us to go. I don't know about you, it's pretty easy for me to convince myself I'm doing better than I really am. And one of the things the law does, <laughs> I think sometimes the law makes us feel like we're actually worse than we really are. I'm not sure that's the point either, but it, it, it's almost like that's what Jesus is trying to do in the Sermon on the Mount, just make us feel, you know, hopeless. So you keep on reading in Matthew chapter 5, uh, toward the end of verse 19, Jesus says, anyone who obeys God's laws and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. And we're like, okay, I kind of like that. And then you get to verse 20. But I warn you, Jesus says, unless your righteousness is better than the righteousness of the teachers of religious law and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Unless your righteousness surpasses the righteousness of the people, everybody in Jesus' day, everybody was in agreement, the most righteous, the most moral, the holiest people around are the Pharisees and teachers of religious law. And Jesus says, unless you're better than that, you'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. That does not sound like good news to me. And you keep reading through the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus' interpretation of the Old Testament law and the prophets, and it feels like it gets worse and worse and worse the farther you go. Don't be angry, Jesus says. If you're angry, it's the same as murder. Lust is the same as adultery. You got people in your life that's really difficult for you to love, and what you really love to do with these people in your life is talk bad about them with your friends. What you love to do is hate your enemies. Jesus says, no, you're supposed to love your enemies. You're supposed to pray for the people who persecute you. How are you doing on just those four? Anger, lust, loving your enemies, praying for those who persecute you. Unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and teachers of religious law, you'll never enter the kingdom of heaven, Jesus says. And you start to feel like, ah, this isn't looking good. And then you keep going. Do not worry, Jesus says. Don't worry about having enough money or enough food. Don't worry about having the right kind of clothes or don't worry about tomorrow. Don't worry about the future. How are you doing on that one? As we figure out how to live with the reality of COVID-19, as we figure out how to live with the reality that a vaccine will come one day, but when that day is, it's, it's a, a ways from now. And how do we live in between now and then? There's going to be a lot of decisions that have to be made by leaders of politics, uh, government, uh, leaders in our school districts, uh, leaders in churches. And I think I can guarantee you will not have 100% agreement with all the decisions that get made. Jesus says, do not judge. 
do not judge. Over and over, as you read through the Sermon on the Mount, what we see Jesus doing is raising the bar. You have heard it said, like, this is the standard. And Jesus says, but I say, the bar is even higher than that. The standard that we're shooting for is even higher than that. In fact, Jesus makes it crystal clear what the standard is in the Sermon on the Mount. This is Matthew 5, verse 48. Again, let's read this out loud together. You are to be perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. Seriously? That's the standard? That's the goal? That's what we're shooting for? Perfection? I mean, how's that going for you? What, what's Jesus trying to... I mean, I know, I understand. Jesus says, listen, with God, all things are possible, but... Does your faith actually help you go there? Yeah, God's going to help me become perfect. Again, what is Jesus doing here? Where where is he taking us? Where is he leading us? This gets us to the third use of the law, according to Luther, and that is the law functions as a guide. I sometimes joke, I'm kind of indoorsy. I love nature. I love the outdoors. I just want to be inside my car with the windows up and the air conditioning on as I'm driving through nature, looking at how uh, beautiful it is. Uh, the first church that I worked at uh, 25 years ago was a youth guy, and it was a pretty outdoorsy church. And they wanted me to be doing these outdoor adventures with the middle school students and the high school students. So we'd have a middle school sh- ski trip and a high school ski trip. And we took the high schoolers to the Boundary Waters for just a miserable week one time. And uh, yes, yeah, some of you have been to the Boundary Waters. So uh, we did a whitewater rafting trip in Colorado and Utah one summer. And on that trip, there were three guides who went with us. And they knew the canyon, they knew the river, they knew what parts of the rapids to avoid if you didn't want to capsize. And so that's where we would go on purpose because we wanted to try to capsize. They knew where to camp so that it would be at least a little bit comfortable when you're sleeping on the ground at night. Because of those three guides, that trip was an incredible trip even for an indoorsy guy like me. And, and part of what Luther is saying the, the law and the prophets, the scripture functions as a guide in our life to help us experience an incredible life, an incredible life on this earth, an incredible life for all of eternity if we go the Jesus way of life, if we follow Jesus. That's what leads to an abundant life. In, in Jesus' day, what they believed led to an abundant life was follow Torah, follow the commands, be obedient. Jesus is not opposed to obedience. He want, If you love me, obey my commands, he says. Obedience means a lot to Jesus. The question is, are we obedient to the written law, the Torah, or are we obedient to something else? Jesus didn't come to abolish the law and the prophets. He came to fulfill them, to accomplish their purpose. Jesus is the law personified. Jesus doesn't go around saying, follow the law, follow the law, follow the law. He goes around inviting people to follow him, follow Jesus, the personification of the law. This is what will lead you to the very best kind of life. Now, unfortunately, we're not perfect. And Jesus is going to say, follow me. And we're going to say, no, I'm going to try my own way. And we're going to get hurt and we're going to hurt others. And we're going to realize, we're going to see our flaws and our imperfections. But here's the good news. Jesus will always point us to the standard. He he never lowers the bar. He never changes the bar based on changing cultural realities. Jesus teaches to a standard. He points us to a standard. And Jesus refuses to condemn us when we fall short of that standard. Again, don't, don't misunderstand me. If we continue all of our life to say no thank you to Jesus' way... Eventually, Jesus will let us have our own way. He'll let us have life apart from him. He'll he'll let us take ourselves down the highway to hell. But Jesus doesn't send us there. Every time we fall, he is there with us to pick us up, to get us out of the gutter, and to set our feet on the firm foundation to help us continue walking down the path to life. His way is the way of grace. It doesn't mean obedience doesn't matter. We've been set free. We've been set free. But we don't use our freedom to go our own way. We use our freedom to love and to serve one another in Jesus' name.
Let's stand together. I want to pray with you. And uh, the band will come out and we'll sing one more song together. But let's pray first. So, Lord, uh, we just pause and we confess to you that there are all kinds of times and in all kinds of ways that we continue to choose to go our own way. Uh, we know that you invite us to follow you. We know that's the best thing for us, and, and still we find ourselves choosing other directions. So we pray that this would be a moment that you get us back on the right track, that you continue to uh, point us to the life that you have for us, the life that you desire for us, a life that's filled with love and grace and uh, second chances, a, a life that's filled with love for the world around us. So, Lord, when we fall, when we stumble, when we are on our knees, may, may we not experience that as a place of guilt and shame that's so overwhelming that it causes us to give up. But, but may we, Lord, fall to our knees and confess with our mouth that you are Lord, you are Savior, you are just what we need in Jesus' name. Amen.